A ceasefire deal has been reached in the contested region of Nagorno-Karabakh after a brief round of fighting. Why are tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan on the rise again? The Indian government has introduced a bill for a 33% quota for women in national and state legislatures. Now, this has been a long time demand of women's movements, but what is the devil in the details? And finally, health workers, researchers and activists are gathering over the next few days to discuss capitalism, pandemics and public health. Why is this discussion important? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. A ceasefire has been announced in the contested region of Nagorno-Karabakh after fighting broke out on Tuesday. Azerbaijan had launched what it called anti-terrorism operations, claiming that neighbouring Armenia's forces were gathering in the region in violation of an earlier ceasefire deal. Now, Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan, but it has a majority Armenian population. And the two countries have been in a conflict over this region for decades. We go to Abdul to understand the latest from the region. Abdul, quite a complicated situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. You have mentioned it in a couple of episodes in the past. Uh, it seems like something breaks out there every few months. So before going to the latest developments, could you just maybe give us a very brief history of why this region is so uh, you know, conflicted and what is the contest about it, so to speak? Well, it is primarily a dispute over the uh, some ethnic right to self-determination, which has been basically in a... Uh, in focus primarily since the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1990-91. Uh, after that, when the uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia emerged as two uh, independent republics, there were populations in uh, Azerbaijan, Armenian population in Azerbaijan, which basically did not want to remain in Azerbaijan and they declare independent republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. Of course, the territory is not recognized as uh, independent by the global community. It is recognized as a part of Azerbaijan. and uh, But the status quo was maintained due to the ceasefire agreement, which was signed in 1994. And ever since, this uh, conflict has not been resolved. And from time to time, Azerbaijan tries to uh, assert its sovereignty over the territory, uh, claiming that Ar Ar Armenia is basically using Nagorno-Karabakh uh, the, the Armenian population in Nagorno-Karabakh to basically incite uh, a separatist movement there. So it has become a very complex issue, despite the fact that there is a global uh, uh, precedence about resolving the issue of either through territorial exchange or the exchange of population. None of the countries in the region and uh, at the global uh, stage have been able to convince either of two countries to basically look for uh, uh, structural uh, solutions, and that basically has led to the persistence of the crisis. So there has been three different level of wars, full-fledged war between both the countries, sometimes involving the regional players as well, and leading to the uh, death of thousands of people since 1991 till 2020. 20, 2020, there was a kind of, again, a ceasefire agreement after months of conflict, uh, months of fighting, uh, which basically led to the uh, deployment of Russian uh, peacekeepers. Around 2,000 Russian peacekeepers were there. But despite the fact that there were Russian peacekeepers, the conflict between both the countries did not die down. And Azerbaijan has been claiming for a very long time that Armenia has been basically uh, trying to deploy its troops there, has basically interfered in the region, and so on and so forth. And Armenians or the other hand have been complaining about uh, Azerbaijan using quote unquote non state actors to basically harass the Armenian population there. So, this the background has always been hostile, and basically, and that's what is the uh, you can say is the uh, reason behind the latest uh, uh, round of conflict, also. Right. Uh, thankfully, this round seems to have been resolved relatively quickly, though, because although there have been a number of deaths reported. So could you just take us to what happened in the past 24 hours as well? Well, uh, on Tuesday, uh, uh, Azerbaijan started a, a kind of quote-unquote military, local military campaign against what it claimed 
the terrorist element. It, uh, the uh, Azari, Azari government claimed that uh, Azerbaijan has used the ceasefire agreement signed in 2000 to basically amass its troops in Armenia, uh, in sorry, in Nagorno Karabakh, which basically threatens the larger security of not only the Nagorno Karabakh, the uh, uh, Azri claims over Nagorno Karabakh, but also threatens the Azri uh, sovereignty. And that basically led to uh, uh, the intervention. Uh, Azerbaijan government also claimed that uh, the there was local elections held in Nagorno Karabakh uh, earlier this month, uh, and that local election it claimed was basically an attempt by the Armenians to be undermine the uh, Azeri sovereignty over the territory. So all these things led to basically that was the claim by the Azerbaijani government, which basically quote unquote justified from their point of view the military intervention there. So the military intervention uh, within 24 hours it got resolved as you, there is a ceasefire agreement signed, but within these 24 hours. Um, uh, there are, of course, different numbers, around 7 to 38. Uh, there are numbers vary. People have been killed, reportedly killed, and more than 200 people, including the combatants, uh, uh, reported to be injured. Uh, Russia, uh, United Nations, uh, other global powers basically intervened uh, immediately. And uh, due to the multiple interventions, one can say, basically, uh, this ceasefire agreement was uh, signed uh, soon, but uh, nevertheless, the uh, the the base of the conflict remains the same uh, uh, until the global players kind of uh, take a, uh, a decisive move and try to address the uh, issue of the ter territory and the Armenian population. There, uh, this ceasefire again uh, means nothing. This will continue in the future and. We should. Uh, we will see much more uh, conflict in the future as well. Yeah. Grim prognosis, there, Abdul. But also quickly, you mentioned that this is also over time become a bit of a regional conflict. Also, so what are the stances taken by various regional players when it is on this issue? Well, uh, uh, there are two major players uh, when we when it comes to regional uh, uh, geostrategic geopolitical calculations. One is Turkey, which basically has. Uh, overtly supported the Azeri attempts to uh, regain control over Nagorno-Karabakh by force if possible. And in 2020 in particular, it was openly providing uh, armaments and other diplomatic support to the Azeri uh, move into the territory. And uh, Russians, of course, who, which basically have tried to play a much more mediated role to bring both the parties on the table, and uh, because this conflict in its uh, uh, in its in that territory in the region, sorry, threatens uh, uh, Russia's uh, stability in uh, larger uh, region, and that is not in the interest of Russia. And Russia also thinks that this is this conflict is used by the uh, U.S. and other uh, global powers to basically find a space to intervene and in the region and kind of threaten the overall uh, uh, stability uh, of both the, because there is also a George, also Georgia nearby, which also right. has uh, similar conflicts uh, going on. And if this conflict, uh, conflict continues the way it is continuing, it will basically provide a larger excuse for the uh, uh, interventions by the countries, which is not desirable for the regional peace. So Russia has been trying to, kind of uh, uh, play a role of a peace uh, mediator between both the countries, but it has not been uh, uh, very successful in that so far. Thanks so much, Abdul, for talking to us. Uh, like I said, like you said, this is a conflict which keeps, you know, uh, bubbling at various points of time and definitely it's been decades now, like you said, uh, resolution still very elusive as of now. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's been a season of high political drama in India. After a high-profile G20 summit, the country's new parliament building was inaugurated with great pomp and fanfare in a special session of the legislature. Now, the right-wing Narendra Modi government also dropped a political bombshell by introducing a bill that will give women 33% reservation in parliament and state legislatures. This proposal has been pending approval for years, even as women's organizations have been waging a consistent struggle for it. So the introduction of this bill should have been a cause for celebration throughout the political spectrum. But there is a catch. This bill, which is likely to be passed in the coming days, will not be implemented now. 
In fact, it may take many years for its implementation. This has been widely criticized and many say this is a savvy publicity move by the government which faces elections in 2024. We go to Pragya Singh of NewsClick to understand more. Pragya, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, quite a progressive bill, it seems like, or on the face of it. Uh, but there's, there seems to be a bit of a catch when it comes to its implementation. So, before we go into the bit of a history of this bill, could you maybe take us through uh, what immediately people are saying as far as this bill's uh, implementation is concerned? Right, Prashant. It is actually a very progressive idea. But the problem with the bill that the government has introduced in the new parliament building as a sort of showcase of uh, how concerned it is about women is basically it doesn't have a deadline. Uh, the statement of objects and reasons of any bill contains a timeline of its implementation. Here, the timeline is incumbent. It's con contingent on two other very significant developments first taking place, which are in the government's hands, which is to redraw the limits of the electoral constituencies across the country and that itself will be based on a fresh census operation, which takes all of this will take at least a couple of years each. So what it essentially and we do not know what are the other contingencies that will arise in the uh, in the future. So the criticism that is coming from the women's groups, actually quite a large number of women have demanded reservation in the uh, parliament and in the uh, state assemblies for decades, three decades. And they say that whenever it comes to women's issues and women's rights, it's contingent, there are conditions attached, and that is what is being done again. Right. So in this context also, you mentioned it already, but could you give us a brief history of why this proposal on the, like, like you said, it's a radical proposal, it's a very important proposal, 33% of seats for women. But why is it that it has been pending for so long? Exactly. I mean, that's where the intention comes in, right? Now, successive governments have tabled the bill in the parliament and the rules are such, the rules of how the parliament uh, functions are such that bills, most bills tend to lapse unless they are cleared by both houses of parliament within an ongoing session. So I'm, I'm just giving you the, the picture and the broad strokes of it. So at every point at which this bill has been introduced, there have been objections. Sometimes it's about whether uh, the women's quota, or the women's reservation should include a sub quota or separate reservations within this reservation for people from disadvantaged communities. The extent of reservation itself has been a matter of very hotly contested discussions. And I think even this year, women's groups have said that, look, I mean, 33% was the bare minimum we demanded then, back in the 80s, when women were out on the streets agitating and demanding a fair share in representation. And today, when you have already got a certain number of women at the lowest level of representation at the rural level and at the at the town and city level, then at this point, we should be ready for 50%. Why not 50% reservation? The other set of, uh, prob you know, the problems with this bill also include the fact that, you know, there's an accusation that the ruling BJP is using it as an election manifesto, meaning that it will be a promise which they're not really in a position to implement immediately. Not just that, they're not giving you a timeline for when it will happen. So it will seem like something great is happening, but we don't really know whether it will. And this has been a successive problem, a consistent problem with this uh, particular ruling party from the time it came to power in 2014 under the current dispensation. The, the other fundamental issue that women are raising is that this party owes itself, its existence to a, a, a rather right-wing fundamentalist Hindu organization, which has repeatedly made statements against women. So the question is that, is there a fundamental change in how they see women? Uh, is there going to be a sort of a push for representation of women who support their ideology? How are they going to ensure against that? All these questions arise, but the basic question, Prashant, is that this is not going to happen in time for the next national election, 2024. We do not know when it is going to actually kick into action. So it's a wait and watch game. And this has played out repeatedly when it comes to women. In, in a sense, it has angered women as much as it has given some of us hope that, well, this might actually see light of day. Thank you, Pragya, so much for that analysis. And I think no wonder that many people are saying that this government has been in power since 2014. 
with a majority, but uh, it's, uh, it, nothing has happened on, this, on these lines so far. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks, Prashant. And finally, the 19th International Association of Health Policy in Europe conference is set to begin on September 21st in Greece on the theme of capitalism, pandemic and public health. Now, the pandemic's impact continues to linger in various ways. And if there was one thing it demonstrated, it is that capitalism contributed to worsening the crisis. From austerity policies and privatization to vaccine inequity, the hand of capitalism was and continues to be visible everywhere. And hence, to get a sense of the discussions that will be held, we go to Anna of the People's Health Movement. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. We don't often discuss conferences on this show, but the theme of this specific conference, which is capitalism, pandemic, and public health is something that is very dear to us, something we have covered a lot on this show. So maybe first a very general question, as when you're talking about, we understand why pandemics and public health would be talked about in a conference of professionals and researchers on this subject. But it's interesting that capitalism is also very central to this discussion. So maybe could you take us through the gamut of issues or the larger picture, why capitalism itself is so central to this debate when we're talking about pandemics and public health? Absolutely, and I think it's a very well-made point. Uh, so essentially, when we talk about the International Association for um, Health Policy in Europe, uh, it's a very particular organization specifically because it tries to bring together uh, the academic research, but also the activist picture. So it's a very specific conference in the context of Europe because it's not only about uh, academics coming to uh, discuss topics that we have, you know, uh, talked on and on about and we uh, have collected data on, uh, but they come to discuss it with activists who are actually living through uh, what the dat data is showing. Uh, and this kind of uh, openness uh, to different opinions and to different perspectives is something that makes the conference unique. Uh, and I think that if we look back at um, so uh, at the past editions of this conference, uh, this is the 19th, if, uh, I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it has shown uh, that this kind of approach actually makes a more constructive uh, a more, it leads to more uh, constructive outcomes because it essentially does what we should be doing in practice all the time. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, working together both on the theory and on the practice of things. So, uh, in order to achieve, uh, in order to achieve the right to health as it was originally meant. Right, and in this context, of course, also looking at the p present situation in Europe, we've talked about this in various episodes in the past. I think we can definitely see what is more than a crisis in one country. It's definitely a systemic crisis spurred by certain common factors. So could you maybe also take us through some of those factors which are, you know, which are indicative of the crisis? Uh, yeah, and I think we're talking about many, many crises in Europe at, right at this time. Um, but essentially what, uh, what the program of the conference is trying to do is trying to capture uh, the main issues that have come up. Uh, over the past uh, past few years, so we'll hear talk, uh, we'll hear discussions uh, about um, academic freedom, which is a key issue in several in several countries. Uh, so, of course, not only in Europe, but also in Palestine uh, and uh, in other countries, uh, and specifically because we have seen that. Um, the crackdown on progressive uh, academics and specifically on progressive medical associations is becoming uh, more difficult, uh, more difficult to handle. So one of the speakers uh, will be the president of the Turkish Medical Association, uh, who was jailed, uh, as we have spoken on the show uh, also before. Uh, because of the work of the good work that uh, the Turkish Medical Association does. Um, we will also have the chance to hear from Shada Ode, who spent uh, uh, who spent uh, one year in uh, in in an Israeli jail, also because of the good work that was being done on the ground. Um, but in addition to the uh, these topics, uh, there will also be spaces to discuss different approaches to climate justice, which we have seen is becoming a major topic in Europe. But what is still unclear is, uh, you know, how how to make sure that uh, the European response. Uh, to the climate crisis is actually something that benefits the global south uh, instead of being focused only on the global north. Uh, this is something that will definitely uh, be a prominent debate in uh, in the conference. And then, of course, finally, you know, uh, the whole issue of privatization, the whole issue of how the COVID-19 pandemic was handled in Europe, um, to get, including the discussion on vaccines and on uh, and including the discussion about Europe's responsibility towards. Uh, ensuring uh, that uh, the world should have uh, swift access to the vaccine uh, and 
a responsibility that Europe failed majorly uh, when uh, in uh, will be there uh, to be discussed. And um, so I, I mentioned some names, so there there will be quite prominent speakers present at uh, uh, at, uh, at the conference, including the conference organizers who are from the uh, Aristotle um, University of Thessaloniki, uh, Alexis Benos and Elias Condelis, uh, among others. Uh, but there will also be plenty of space for younger researchers and young activists uh, to present what they're working on. And I think this is another dimension that the conference is really specific for, because it essentially provides the space for people who are trying to investigate new things and who are trying to, uh, to, bring, uh, to bring new perspectives into the overall discussion about health activism, health activism and health research, uh, it gives them the space to do so and to, to meet peers from, uh, from different parts of, the, uh, of Europe. Absolutely right, of course. Uh, also, another issue I su suppose would also be the question of staffing and recruitment itself, which is connected to privatization, the question of austerity as well. We've talked about in the past the issue of how, you know, the shortage of or the deficit of health professionals in Europe is trying to, be, the attempt is to meet it by recruiting from the global south as well, which really makes matters in the global south much worse. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, and of course, you know, the, I think that uh, what we see at the conference is that there are a lot of health workers, but not only health workers in the sense that they research healthcare, but also health workers who are actually coming from the hospitals and they're coming from migrant backgrounds uh, and they're essentially here at the conference to talk about what they experience and how the uh, overall staffing shortage is impacting them uh, in, uh, in their everyday work. So it, it's uh, it's something quite quite important to keep in mind that you know the shortages that we keep talking about they have very particular um, particular uh, impacts on the people who are actually doing health healthcare work. Absolutely, thank you so much, Anna. We'll probably track the conference in the coming days as well. The pandemic is you know its impact definitely still very much lingering in all of our societies, and I think very important to keep talking about it. So thank you so much. That's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. Do tune in tomorrow for a fresh episode. Also visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and or check out all our social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube and haven't hit that subscribe button already, please do. See you tomorrow.